Thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you very much for the committees of Parliament and the work they're doing on this. It is a critical issue, and I want to give three reasons why we have to think very seriously about a Eurozone budget. The first is the international role of the Euro. Um, I have been critical sometimes of Commission and ECB forecasts of growth when they've had statements of the type, well, growth isn't doing so well and there are various headwinds and the world economy isn't doing so well, so we might do a bit worse. But that is something Greece can say, it's something Bolivia can say, Finland can say, but it's not something Europe can say. Europe is not a small closed economy. Uh, a small open economy, Europe is a large economy. So if the world economy is not doing well, one of the reasons may be that Europe is not doing its bit. At various times in the past and in the future, we'll have various regions of the world doing better or worse. So the Asiatic region might do better or worse, or America might do better or worse. When it's doing worse, then it's important that another area fills the gap. So if Europe is to be, play its role, it cannot just aim to have uh, current account surpluses with respect to the rest of the world, but it has a responsibility for world demand in a way that a small open economy does not. The second has to do with the automatic role of a, of a Eurozone budget. If in Texas we have a recession, then resources go from the federal budget to Texas. They go in terms of subsidies and the Texans paying less taxes. But that's not the only thing that happens. If the federal budget finances those increased resources, uh, by borrowing and having greater bonds, then the Texans are being compensated all by the whole of Americans. Those bonds are repaid, whether you're from Massachusetts, whether you're from Virginia, whether you're from California. And so there are two effects. The one the economists call the stabilization effect. One country has an asymmetric shock and goes to a recession. Resources go into that uh, area. The other is the equalization effect that there is some kind of solidarity in that uh, payment. And of course, the idea is that Texas will be in recession one day, the next time it will be Massachusetts, and we really want to build a Europe where that's the same, where one time it will be Greece in crisis, another time it will be Germany, another time it will be Finland, another time it will be Portugal. The third reason we ha need uh, a European budget is the for discretionary fiscal policy. This has to do with the first issue, which is about the role of the euro in the world economy, but also it has to do with uh, having the right amount of uh, demand at the European level. There are various kinds of externality. The most important externality is that France would want to expand, but a lot of its expansion will benefit Germany or Portugal. And Portugal and Germany might want to expand, but a lot of the benefit will go in terms of uh, imports from the other countries. So the solution is obvious. You expand together. There's an, you internalize the externality that, uh, that, that exists. And it's quite clear to me, at least, that there is a lot of uh, non uh, expansionary fiscal policy, which we need with the high levels of unemployment, um, that is not happening because there's no way so far to internalize that externality. If we don't have these mechanisms, what do we have? If we are not a monetary union in the sense that Canada is a monetary union, that Germany is a monetary union with, with, its, with relation to its lender, the way that uh, Australia is a monetary union. Well, we've got monetary policy, which can't deal with asymmetric shocks. It's not actually uh, clear that it can do, uh, deal with a symmetric shock until we deal with the issue of debt because uh, the monetary policy has almost broken down. Yes, the, the ECB could reduce its interest rates, but that might not affect Spain or Portugal or, or, or Greece. But let's say we have monetary policy. We don't have the devaluation policy because we're a monetary union, and we don't have fiscal policy if we don't have enough fiscal space. So what is left? The wage rate. The wage rate becomes the only shock absorber within the European economy. And I ask you to think very seriously. In 
respect to Euroscepticism, can Europe continue when the only shock observer is the real wage rate? And Michel is completely right. We need two things. We need a monetary union that doesn't just rely on wages being the shock absorber, but we also need a monetary union that has economic tools that take place, uh, take the, the place of devaluation, such as fiscal policy, but they're under democratic control. So if we really want to fight Euroscepticism in the days and months and years after the Brexit vote, that's what we need. We need a Europe that can respond to people's need, that people feel that the wage rate is not the only shock absorber, that the real wages are not only flexible downwards, but they can be flexibly upwards, and we need those policies to be under democratic accountability. That seems to me a way to avoid Euroscepticism, and for pro-Europeans, we need a European Parliament that gives teeth to people to say, yes, it's, we've got a, 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 uh, we've got European wide institutions. Yes, these institutions are good. Yes, these institutions are democratically accountable. Thank you. Piercarlo Paduan. You made this very important event. Uh, let me say that I really appreciated the report also because it has a 